So today is like part five of our sermon series looking at uh, Peter's spirituality. And what we learned in the first week was that one of the reasons he was picked was because he was sort of open because he had hope for a better world. And then last week, we saw this Peter who was so stuck on his idea of the Messiah, this idea that he was a military leader, that he ended up sinking in the water. And now we have this complete change of fortune, right? Because like today... Jesus confronts him directly and says, who do you say that I am? And he gets it. And while we can go on all about the sort of theologies of what does it mean to be keys to the kingdom, what does it mean that's loosed, you know, what's loosened here is loosed in heaven, what's bound here is bound in heaven or whatever, I have a bigger question than any of those sort of theological treatises in there. My bigger question is, what happened? Right? Think about it. We went from him seriously doubting that Jesus is the Messiah to getting it in like a week. Which means we should go back and see like what happened since the last time we checked in with Peter because surely a lot has happened to him. The reality is if you were to read from Peter walking in the water to now, only three things occur in between the two. But I think the three things change his mind and his perspective. So the first thing that happens after the sinking in the water is that Jesus goes back to the temple as he had, and the Pharisees this time are ready for him because if you had read earlier, he had been criticizing the Pharisees, as we know Jesus enjoys doing, right? And when the Pharisees see that Jesus and his followers are coming and Jesus is going to start teaching, they basically walk up to him and say, hi. Jesus is like, hey, you guys are here. And they're like, yeah. You know what? We'll listen to you when your followers learn how to clean their hands before they eat correctly. Because right now, they don't wash their hands before they eat, and we don't listen to people who do not wash before you eat. Bizarre, right? And But we've all met that person, right? Basically, what the Pharisees do is they reject anything Jesus is going to say about them off the bat, before he even begins into them or begins talking to them, or begins teaching, they basically say, dude, you're not worth my time. If you were actually a good religious leader, your folks would know how to wash their hands, but they are not worth our time. Once they can conform to our cultural values, then I'll listen to you. For any of you who knows, like, logic things, that is a fallacy of logic, right? See... I think Peter watches this entire conversation occur because Jesus then does critique the Pharisees and they basically ignore him. And he has this moment where he sees what was the sort of theological academy of his time basically show that at that moment in time, they weren't really searching for truth. They weren't really on a spiritual quest looking for truth because had they been on one, they would have at least heard Jesus out and then retorted him if they disagreed, right? And yet what they do is they just say, well, you know what? The people who follow you are all horrible. I'm not listening to you. And they slam the door in his face because they're not really searching for truth. They're searching to be right. And that's very different. We've all had that conversation with someone, right? The conversation where we're taking on an important issue. And somewhere about three minutes into the conversation, you realize they're not actually listening, right? Or if they are listening, they're only listening insofar as to know what talking points to rebuttal against you with. They're not really trying to solve the problem. They're just trying to fight with you. If you've never had this sort of conversation, go find someone of the opposite political party than yours and start talking about politics. And I will bet you, you will have a conversation with someone who is probably just thinking about their talking points in response to you, rather than really being open to like, this is a policy decision that we could solve this problem with, right? We've all been there. I think at this moment, Peter's like, wow. Those religious leaders aren't really on a spiritual journey because they think they've made it. 
One of the other things that occurs is that Jesus has the next feeding of folks. Remember, before they got in the boat, he had the feeding of the 5,000, right? And he fed the 5,000, and then they try to make him king, and he turns them down. And this is one of the things that really disturbs Peter's sort of worldview, because he thinks the Messiah should be building legions, and 5,000 is a legion-level number. He has a repeat. He feeds 4,000 people, but this time with seven loaves of bread and seven fish, far more than he needed to feed 5,000. And I think there's a good note of how Peter, looking in on this, would have seen it. Think about it. If you are out there to entertain, or if you're out there to build momentum for a political campaign, the last thing you want to see is 5,000 people last week and 4,000 people this week, right? 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 Okay, what we have is I think we had 5,000 people last week who were like, this is an awesome magic show, and maybe we can start a revolution, some combination of that. And then after they offered to make him king and have him fight the revolution, when he said, no way, no how, not going to do it, a 1,000 of them are like, well, heck with you then, I'm not coming back. You're not doing, I'm not really looking for truth. I'm just looking to see if you're the Messiah that I already believe I want. And he turned out it wasn't that. Or I'm just looking for entertainment. It doesn't occur to me that maybe the whole goal of the miracle wasn't to prove how miraculous God was, but simply there are 4,000 people he fed 100% of them. When there are 5,000 people, he fed 100% of them. In fact, if you're in charge of like, I don't know, a soup kitchen or a food pantry. You would love it if you went from 5,000 people needing food to 4,000 people. That's victory, right? And yet, I don't think any of them saw it that way. And I think what Peter realized is that these folks were at some level either looking for entertainment or the backing of their ideology. We see that in churches today too, right? There are churches out there that are ready and primed to come out and say, your ideology as a fill in a party or fill in an ideology is correct and God is with you, right? Our evangelical brethren, our non-denominational brethren fall for that all the time, right? Where they are attached to a party. It's worth noting, well, they're not as prevalent. We have that on the left too. Churches that will simply tell you that if you're on the left with them, you are absolutely with God. Others will say, if you're on the right with them, you're absolutely with God. And they're just there to tell you your ideology is in fact correct. Don't worry. Whether or not it's right or left. Problem is, if that's what you're doing, if that's why you go to church, you're not really on a spiritual path because you're not really searching for truth. You're searching for affirmation. You're not searching for affirmation that you're on a spiritual path. You're searching for affirmation that your ideology is right, whether or not right or left. Or maybe you're just searching for entertainment. We've all been to that church too. Then there's a third story that occurs. I argue outside of those things which occur in Holy Week and the birth of Jesus, this is the greatest miracle in the Gospel of Matthew, and it comes up in one way or another in all the other Gospels, is the meeting with the Canaanite woman. The Jesus goes and is talking about that he's the living bread. Okay, We all get that, right? I'm the living bread, da 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 And he's talking to this Canaanite, he's talking, and this Canaanite woman says, I want in on this uh, living bread. And he says, you dog, leave me alone. I am not taking the food from the people of Israel or the Jewish people, depending on how you translate it, and giving it to the likes of you. Real big moment Jesus messes up. She turns to him and says, even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the master's table. I say this is the biggest miracle because what happens next is a transformation of Christ himself. Because up to this moment, up to this one discussion, he says in self-description, I am here as the Messiah for the people of Israel, or I am here as the Messiah for the Jewish people. He's got a very definitive line as who he is here to help. If you're a Babylonian, he is not here to help you. If you're an Egyptian, he is not here to help you. And then he meets this Canaanite woman. Someone that he has a million ways to socially just ignore. 
He could have said, you're a woman, I don't want to listen to you. That would have been socially acceptable in this time. He said, you're a Canaanite, I don't want to listen to you. That would have been socially acceptable in the time. He could have said, you're illiterate, I don't want to listen to you. That would have been socially acceptable at his time. And yet he listens so much so that after this moment, he will always describe himself as the Messiah sent by God to save the world. Because it is in that moment that Jesus realizes a truth about his own definition of Messiah. That not only did Peter's definition of Messiah was wrong, Jesus has known that for a while, but he didn't realize that his own definition of what he was meant to do was wrong. But because he is searching for the truth, because he is willing to listen to the other, he hears his own father's words in the mouth of that Canaanite woman, a person the world said he shouldn't listen to. But it's in that that he starts down the road to fulfill his actual destiny, a savior not just for Israel, a savior not just for the Jewish people, a savior for everyone. I think for us in our own day, this is an important lesson. I think this harkens back to why Peter got chosen in the first place. See, Peter was chosen because he had this openness, this strive, this love to find the truth, to hear God, to experience the Spirit, and to hear a calling. He wasn't in this to get his ideology affirmed. He wasn't in this to get entertained. He wasn't in this to be right. He was in this to go on a path and find God. And when we truly are spiritually awake, when we truly are spiritually wandering and looking, we cast off wanting our ideology affirmed, wanting to be entertained, or wanting to be proven that we're right. And we simply humbly look for the Spirit, look for the divine, and listen to all around us in hopes to hear those whispers. So as you go out today, ask yourself this question. How open are you to the idea you're wrong? How determined are you to search out the truth, even if it's uncomfortable? How open are you to having your own moment like Christ, the Canaanite woman, helping you see what God wants you to see? How open are you to be like Peter and follow because you just want to find the divine that much? Amen.